to his touch. Did the sun, which shone so brightly everywhere else, really fall upon him? Or was there, as it rather seemed, a circle of ominous shadow moving along with his deformity whichever way he turned himself? And whither was he now going? Would he not suddenly sink into the earth, leaving a barren and blasted spot where in due course of time would be seen deadly nightshade, dogwood, henbane, and whatever else of vegetable wickedness the climate could produce, all flourishing with hideous luxuriance? Or would he spread bat's wings and flee away, looking so much the uglier the higher he rose towards heaven? Be it sin or no, said Hester Prynne bitterly, as still she gazed after him, I hate the man. So a lot of symbolism there as she's watching Chillingworth. Uh, most of it, if you think of bats, what color are bats? What color was his beard? What types of herbs was he collecting? All that symbolism. She upbraided herself for the sentiment, but could not overcome or lessen it. Attempting to do so, she thought of those long past days in a distant land when he used to emerge at, at eventide from the seclusion of his study and sit down in the firelight of their home, and in the light of her nuptial smile. He needed to bask himself in that smile, he said, in order that the chill of so many lonely hours among his books might be taken off the scholar's heart. Such scenes had once appeared not otherwise than happy, but now, as viewed through the dismal medium of her subsequent life, they classed themselves among her ugliest remembrances. So right here, had not once appeared, had once appeared not otherwise than happy. So she used to think of those times as happy. But now given the circumstance, given what she knows, she can't look back on them with happy memories or with fondness. She marveled how such scenes could have been. She marveled how she could ever have been wrought upon to marry him. She deemed in her crime most to be repented of that she had never or that she had ever endured and reciprocated the lukewarm grasp of his hand and had suffered the smile of her lips and eyes to mingle and melt into his own and it seemed a fouler offense committed by Roger Chillingworth than any which had since been done him that in the time when her heart knew no better he had persuaded her to fancy herself happy by his side Yes, I hate him, repeated Hester, more bitterly than before. He betrayed me. He has done me worse wrong than I did him. Let men tremble to win the hand of a woman, unless they win along with it the utmost passion of her heart. Else it may be their miserable fortune, as it was Roger Chillingworth's, when some mightier touch than their own may have awakened all her sensibilities, to be reproached even for the calm content, the marble image of happiness, which they will have imposed upon her as the warm reality. But Hester ought long ago to have done with this injustice. When did it betoken? Had seven long years under the torture of the scarlet letter inflicted so much of the misery and wrought out no repentance? The emotion of that brief space, while she stood gazing after the crooked figure of old Roger Chillingworth, threw a dark light on Hester's state of mind, revealing much that she might not otherwise have acknowledged to herself. He being gone, she summoned back her child. Pearl! Little Pearl, where are you? Pearl, whose activity of spirit never flagged, had been at lo no loss for amusement while her mother talked with the old gatherer of herbs. At first, as already told, she had flirted fancifully with her own image in a pool of water, beckoning the phantom forth, and, as it declined to venture, seek a, seeking a passage for herself into its sphere of impalpable earth and unattainable sky. Soon finding, however, that either she or the image was unreal, she turned elsewhere for better pastime. She made little boats out of birch bark and frightened them with snail shells and sent out more ventures on the mighty deep than any merchant in New England. But the larger part of them foundered near the shore. She seized a live horseshoe by the tail and made prize of several five fingers and laid out a jellyfish to melt in the warm sun. Then she took up the white foam that streaked the line of the advancing tide and threw it upon the breeze, scampering after it with winged footsteps to catch the great snowflakes ere they fell. Perceiving a flock of beach birds that fed and fluttered along the shore, 
The naughty child picked up her apron full of pebbles and, creeping from rock to rock after the small sea fowl, displayed remarkable dexterity in pelting them. One little gray bird with a white breast, Pearl was almost sure had been hit by a pebble and fluttered away with a broken wing. But then the elf child sighed and gave up her sport because it grieved her to have done harm to a little bean that was as wild as the sea breeze or as wild as Pearl herself. So as wild as Pearl herself. So it's almost as if she is seeing herself in this little bird and this wild bird, right? And before this feeling of guilt where she is able to empathize, empathize some with the bird, she has broken a bird's wing supposedly with a pebble, and before that, uh, torn the arm off of a, a five-fingered star, so I can you can imagine that it would be a starfish, uh, left a jellyfish out in the sun to melt, so not kind actions to animals. So what could this tell us about Pearl and her, her character, her personality? Her final employment was to gather seaweed of various kinds and make herself a scarf or a mantle and a headdress and thus assume the aspect of a little mermaid. She inherited her mother's gift for devising drapery and costume. As the last touch to her mermaid's garb, Pearl took some eelgrass and imitated as best she could on her own bosom the decoration with which she was so familiar on her mother's. A letter. The letter A. But freshly green instead of scarlet. The child bent her chin upon her breast and contemplated this device with strange interest, even if it was the only thing for which she had been sent into the world was to make out its hidden import. I wonder if mother will ask me what it means, thought Pearl. So to make sense out of this one thing, so she's wondering if her mother will make sense of it or will ask her what it means. But in the meantime, it's almost asking the reader, what do we think it will mean? What do we think about it? The author makes it a point to say that it was green instead of scarlet. So if we think about color symbolism, what could green symbolize and what could that mean? And furthermore, it's made out of seaweed. So we have more connections to symbolism. We can connect it to weeds. We can connect it to the sea and the ocean. We can connect it to color symbolism. There's a variety of ways a reader can interpret what this homemade A could mean for Pearl. Just then she heard her mother's voice, and flitting along as lightly as one of the little seabirds appeared before Hester Prynne dancing, laughing, and pointing her finger to the ornament upon her bosom. So again, as if one of the little seabirds, Pearl is being comp compared to one of the birds again. So this is one of the first times that she's not being referred to as an imp or as an elf, but as a bird. So we're seeing perhaps a little bit of a change in Pearl. My little pearl, said Hester after a moment's silence, the green letter and on thy childish bosom has no purport, but dost thou know, my child, what this letter means, which thy mother is doomed to wear? Yes, mother, said the child, it is the great letter A thou hast taught me in the horn book. Hester looked steadily into her little face, but though there was that singular expression which she had so often remarked in her black eyes, she could not satisfy herself whether pearl was really attached whether Pearl really attached any meaning to the symbol. She felt a morbid desire to ascertain the point. Dost thou know, child, wherefore thy, why, wherefore thy mother wears this letter? Truly I do, answered Pearl, looking brightly into her mother's face. It is for the same reason that the minister keeps his hand over his heart. And what reason is that? asked Hester, half smiling at the absurd incredulity. Incredu sorry, incongruity of the child's observation, but on second thoughts, turning pale. What has the letter to do with any heart save mine? Nay, mother, I have told all I know, said Pearl, more seriously than she was wont to speak. Ask yonder old man with whom thou hast been talking with. It may be he can tell, but in good earnest now, mother dear, what does this scarlet letter mean, and why dost thou wear it on thy bosom, and why does the minister keep his hand over his heart? She took her mother's hand in her own and gazed into her eyes with an earnestness that was seldom seen in her wild and capricious character. The thought occurred to Hester that the child might really be seeking to approach her with childlike confidence, 
and doing what she could, and as intelligently as she knew how, to establish a meeting point of sympathy. It showed Pearl in an unwanted aspect. Heretofore, the mother, while loving her child with the intensity of soul affection, had schooled herself to hope for little other return than the waywardness of an April breeze, which spends its time in airy sport, and has its gusts of inexplicable passion, and its per- petulant in its best of moods, and chills oftener than caresses you, when you take it to your bosom and requital of which misdemeanors it will sometimes, of its own vague purpose, kiss your cheek with a kind of doubtful tenderness and play gently with your hair, and then be gone about its other idle business, leaving a dreamy pleasure at your heart. And this, moreover, was a mother's estimate of the child's disposition. Any other observer might have seen few but unamiable traits and have given them a far darker coloring. But now the idea came strongly into Hester's mind that Pearl, with her remarkable perceptive and acuteness, might already have approached the age when she could be made a friend, and entrusted with as much of her mother's sorrows as could be imparted, without a reverence either to the parent or the child. In the little chaos of Pearl's character there might be seen emerging, and could have been from the very first the steadfast principles of an unflinching courage— an uncontrollable will, sturdy pride, which might be disciplined into self-respect, and a bitter scorn of many things which, when examined, might be found to have the the taint of falsehood in them. She possessed affections, too, though hereto acrid and disagreeable, as are the richest flavors of unripe fruit. With all these sterling attributes, thought Hester, The evil which she inherited from her mother must be great indeed if a noble woman do not grow out of this elfish child. Pearl's inevitable tendency to hover about the enigma of the scarlet letter seemed an innate quality of her being. From the earliest epoch of her conscious life, she had entered upon this as her appointed mission— Hester had often